Welcome to John Gets Games. This is my new games radar vlog for July of 2023, and in it, I'll be talking about 37 games in alphabetical order. This is more than I normally do, but I, even after cutting things down significantly, have ended up with this large list. Uh, so I do want to mention that if you want to listen to this episode in podcast form, you can gain access to that by supporting the Patreon campaign for this channel. That's at patreon.com slash Games, and there's a bunch of other exclusive content you can get there, including listening to my dozens of opinions episodes where I've talked about hundreds of different games, uh, the things I like and don't like, as well as my changing opinion of those games. Uh, you can also watch some videos videos early and advertisement free. So uh, I do want to ask also that if you like this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. And on that note, let's start talking about games. So again, this is going to be in alphabetical order. And for each one of these games, I'm going to be looking at the Board Game Geek uh, page to kind of discuss what they're like. So the very first one, is 1890. Uh, this is a Euro 18xx game from Brazil. Now, I've played a few 18xx games. These are big, long train games, you know, frequently like five plus hours. Uh, but this one says 180 minutes for two to five players. Now, I know I'm not generally like crazy excited about new uh, 18xx games. I've enjoyed the ones I played, but generally they're longer than I like. 180 minutes seems okay, but then down here in particular, it says in this game that blends elements of 18xx with Euro games, we are investors buying and selling shares of companies interested in investing in Brazil's railway lines. The stock market is constantly changing as it reacts to players' interactions with the market itself, as well as the development or lack thereof of the companies. So in particular, it's this bit right here, 18xx with Euro games. Um, 180 minutes seems pretty realistic for a big weighty game, but one that's not going to go maybe five hours. Uh, and I like Euro games and I'm falling in love with train games and I have been for the last couple of years. So this very much has my attention. This seems quite cool. I'm not sure how Euro-y it's going to be. There's not a lot of details about the mechanics. Um, there is an image of one hex tile and it looks nice. Honestly, it's a, it's a pretty looking tile and they have the box cover, which looks fine. Uh, so yeah, I'm super intrigued to learn more about this one. Perhaps it's going to be an 18xx game that uh, I could actually play uh, more often considering I generally don't play the regular ones all that much because they are so long. All right, let's move on to the next game, and that one is Age of Rail, South Africa. It's just funny, with alphabetical sorting, we have a couple of train games here at the beginning. Now, this is a re-implementation, the long-awaited re-implementation of South African Railroads, which is a game that came out in 2011, and um, as far as I can tell, is one of the uh, pinnacle cube rail games, essentially. There's 30 plus cube rail games out there, uh, probably a lot more than 30, but this is the one that most people seem to agree is just about the best. Uh, now, it uh, for a while has been rumored to be the uh, the next Iron Rails game from Capstone Games. They've done Iberian Gage, Ride the Rails, as well as Irish Gage, and here it is. In fact, it just went on Kickstarter this morning. Uh, as of recording this, you're probably going to see this in a few days, uh, but it should still be up on Kickstarter. I backed it immediately because I've played South African Rails uh, twice. Um, this is a new Board Game Geek page, so you can't quite see it. Um, they've barely changed the rules. It's essentially the same game, but this one is going to be like an Age of Rail sim uh, system, I think. Uh, on the Kickstarter, there's a couple of extra maps, and I imagine they're planning on doing more if it's successful. Um, and in those two plays, I really didn't like it the first time, and I really liked it the second time. Uh, I could see future plays being uh, more fun, <laughs> especially than that first game. I played this one really early in my exploration, and I don't think it was a, a very good situation for it. Either way, this new version is very pretty looking. Um, right now, they only have an image of the box cover, on BGG, it looks like, but uh, they do have images of the map and whatnot on the Kickstarter that you can check out. Um, I haven't actually talked about what this game is like, just uh, the hype around it. Um, this is uh, set in South Africa, and it, it shares a lot of similarities with Chicago Express. Um, both of these were winsome titles. But um, there, there are significant differences. The action selection is is more worker placement um, versus Chicago Express. Uh, and this has a point-to-point -point map as opposed to a big hex map. So you go from specific points to specific points. Um, there's a whole bunch of uh, information out there. I mean, there's only one video uh, on the BGG page for this one. But if you go to the South African Railroads Board Game Geek page, there are, well, three videos. <laughs> but still, there's definitely some information about how the original one plays. And I'm excited. I really enjoyed the previous versions. Uh, this is probably going to become my favorite Iron Rails game uh, when I actually have a chance to play it with the final version, which I haven't done just yet, but I'm hoping to soon. 
Next up, we have Asteria. Uh, this it says, discover and conquest planets in a 4X space card war game for two players. Uh, now, I'm not generally all that interested in war games, but this doesn't seem like it's very war gamey. Uh, down below, it says, this is a strategy game in which two players compete for the domination of the galaxy through military, commercial, and technological objectives. Using multi-purpose cards, you collect resources to enhance your military power, research new technologies, and explore new areas of the galaxy in a game with great variety and replayability. Uh, in particular, it says it incorporates 4X, which is extract, expand, explore, and exterminate elements. Uh, in this one, you are going to be, I guess the cards have each of those X's on them as you're selecting what you're going to be doing. Um, it says there's 54 multifunctional cards in this game. It plays in 30 minutes for two players. And I'm intrigued. Uh, every time I see a short 4X game, I I'm always curious to see how they're going about it. Um, I used to love 4X games. They're not really the thing I focus on that much these days. So I'm paying attention to this one and talking about it more because I'm curious to see how they're going to go after it with the multi-use cards and whatnot. Also, it's interesting seeing it as a two-player only game, really honing in on that player count. I'm intrigued. <laughs> Next up, we have Avant Card, which is just an amazing pun <laughs> to start off. Uh, and also, it's got a great uh, production uh, aesthetic, essentially. It says you're going to build the best deck of cubist art. And this game uses these strange tuck boxes. Uh, so the publisher of this one is Resonant, and I follow them on Twitter. And they've been showing the process of designing these tuck boxes for a while. Essentially, the whole game, uh, or these decks of cards, pack into this folding tuck box and you then open it up and it just folds out and folds out and folds out and folds out all the way over. So when you pack the game up, you can put these things back and just fold it, fold it, fold it, fold it, fold it back up again. So when you go to set up the game, it just flops out and then that that's the market. Uh, these are the cards you're going to be grabbing. This is a uh, deck building type game. Uh, there's some videos on BGG that I took a glance at. Uh, it's a deck building game where you're getting different cards and these cards look great. Uh, I love the aesthetic of this game. Uh, and it, it seems like you're playing cards simultaneously to try and have a variety of different numbered cards as you're kind of going up to get you currency to then allow you to buy some more cards. Um, the cards themselves just have numbers on them, but it seems like the real intriguing element to the game are these, uh, I forget the name of them, but they're essentially power cards. Uh, they're associated with people, and they're also associated with the numbers. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how it works, but when you play like a seven card, that will give you the ability to activate the, whatever this seven card here does. So the deck of cards that you have in front of you is just a bunch of numbers, but you can activate these variable effects based off of the numbers that I think can change from one game to the next, which seems interesting. Uh, honestly, I'm mostly talking about this because I think the game looks stunning, and I really like the quirkiness of those fold-out boxes for the various different elements to the game. I don't think this is going to be a game that I'm particularly crazy about. I mean, if somebody had it and asked me if I wanted to play, I'd for sure say yes, but I'm not going to be hunting this one down. But I think it just looks cool. I wanted to talk about it because it looks cool. <laughs> Next up, we have Batak. This is a climbing game where you bid to face off against a team of two opponents. Uh, now, the designer of this game is Shreeshbot, and they are a friend of mine. Um, we've done a bunch of playtesting. Uh, they've playtested my games. I've playtested a bunch of their games. I playtested this game, actually, uh, I think the very first time it was tested. It's now done, and it's a game that you can play. Uh, there is rules to it online that you can check out, and you can build a deck with this one uh, with, I think, at least one deck of cards, you might need a couple decks of cards. Either way, this is essentially a simplified version of Fight the Landlord uh, and Big Three. Uh, I haven't played either of these, but I'm pretty familiar with them. Uh, Fight the Landlord is a three-player only game where in each hand, uh, you're going to deal out the cards and one person will become the landlord and they're fighting against the other two people. But the landlord is going to be different every single round. So it's one versus two. Uh, those two people equally trying to fight and play out all their cards before the landlord. In Batak, it's similar, but there is a little bit more competition between the partnership. Um, you do some bidding uh, based off of the number of points you would win or potentially give to your opponents based off of how strong you think your hand is. And then you score points based off of how early you go out. Um, if you're the landlord, I don't think it really has a name, but if you're the, the person who bid the highest in Batak, um, you're going to get a 3x multiplier if you go out first. Uh, but if you don't, 
then the opposing team, again, it's two people, the person who sheds out first is going to get 2x that multiplier, and then their partner will only get 1x that multiplier. So they'll still get the points. The person who was the landlord um, who didn't go out uh, doesn't get those points, but the person who does play all their cards on that defending team gets double the points of the other one. So you still have a little bit of conflict there. Um, the melt in this game, you know, sets and runs and that kind of thing are a lot more straightforward than fight the landlord. And overall, I really enjoyed my one play of it. Um, uh, it's been interesting to see it develop. I've only played it once since it's been fully completed, and it was a fun game. Um, I did well. I, I think I won that game, so, you know, take it with a grain of salt. But this is a cool three-player only climbing game that is very easy to get into that you could probably play right now based off of the decks of cards that you may or may not have in your house. Next up, we have Bone Wars. Uh, it says, paleontologists trying to outdo each other in the great dino rush. Uh, the designer is Wim Gosens, and the publisher is Game Brewer. Uh, I believe I'm going to be doing a sponsored tutorial video for this game, but uh, I don't know anything more than what you can see here in the description. And it's it's an interesting description. It says, in Bone Wars, players take on the role of paleontologists in the late 1800s. During this time, a bitter rivalry was waged between Othnell Marsh and Edward Cope, two world-renowned paleontologists. They both tried to outdo the other in discovering new species of dinosaur, going so far as to bribe workers, steal, or even destroy bones. The players are paleontologists working for one of these legendary men, or perhaps working on their own behalf, trying to outdo all the competition. Uh, now, this is a hand management game with multi-use cards and worker placement, and it seems like you are going to be doing a bunch of paleontologist things, digging up bones, putting together dinosaurs, but in particular, one thing that jumped out to me was down here. It says, when your paleontologist publishes a paper, it is added to either Marsh's or Cope's side, depending on which side the player is working for. Specific actions will also reward loyalty points for your current patron. At the end of the game, players multiply the number of loyalty they have with one of the two people with the published papers to gain victory points. So what that means is published papers count for all players, and it's up to you to make them count the most for yourself. That kind of sounds like shared incentives, which <laughs> is the buzzword for me over the last couple of years. Um, it's not stocks or anything like that, but it does seem like as you're publishing your papers and you're adding it to one side, if you're adding it to a side that other people are adding it to, it's possible that the papers that you're publishing are going to give points to your opponents, and maybe you don't want that to happen. I don't know how it works any more than that. Right now, they don't have any images of what the game actually looks like beyond the box cover, but I think the game sounds cool. It's a, definitely a neat uh, theme. It's not the first game to go after uh, paleontologists, but uh, I don't think I've actually played any of the many that have come out that I've heard about. Either way, I'm probably going to learn a lot more about this one when I make the video, and uh, I think it's pretty intriguing. Next up, we have an old game. This is Carcassonne The Discovery. It came out in 2005. I only just learned about this in the last month or so. That's why I'm talking about it now. In particular, I heard about it because it's a Carcassonne with Leo Colvini as a co-designer. Klaus Jürgen Reed is the original designer of Carcassonne. Uh, and then, yeah, I was told that Leo Colvini made a version of Carcassonne, and I was super intrigued because Colvini's designs are strange, usually very elegant, and uh, fun. I, I generally quite like Colvini designs. So I looked into this one. Uh, there's some videos. I watched a Board Games with Scott video to learn about how the game played, and it seems pretty intriguing. Uh, it is a Carcassonne game. In it, you're going to be getting one tile, and you're going to place it down onto the board in a shared space. The tiles have to match all the different sides. In this one, it's like grasslands, water, and mountains. And just like in Carcassonne, you can place a meeple down onto the tile that you put down. But this is where it gets different. Um, in Carcassonne, the meeples that go down will stay there until a certain situation happens where you score and you pull the meeple back, or certain meeples, the farmers, will just stay there for the rest of the game, which is a cool tension and one of the, my favorite parts of the game overall. In the Discovery, it's, it's different. You put a meeple down or you pull a meeple back up again on your turn. You do one or the other or, is it, or neither of those things, and you only have four meeples, so you're really restricted. When you pull a meeple back, if the region it was pulled back from is complete, you will score a 2x multiplier for what that region scores for. It's different for the plains and the water and the mountains, um, effectively a 2x multiplier. Um, and you'll get those points immediately, and then on your following turn, you can put that meeple out. Whereas if you pull a meeple back uh, from an area that's not complete, you get a 1x multiplier. Essentially, there's a little bit more uh, distinctions between the different areas, but I'm trying to do a high-level overview. So essentially, you're trying to get points by putting these meeple meeples out into areas where you think they're going to be fully enclosed. There is some competition between players trying to invade uh, large areas, and if there is a tie, you know, essentially for meeples there, it's not area majority. You just both get to pull the meeple back and score those points, but you only have so many turns in this game, and at the end of the game, all the meeples that are still out here on the board will just score as if their regions were not complete. So if you have meeples incomplete, 
complete regions, the onus is on you to spend your turn pulling a meeple back to get that bigger payout. But of course, if you're pulling a meeple back, you're not putting a meeple down. Um, it seems like this is, in general, a more streamlined version of Carcassonne than even the base game, which is a, a very streamlined overall experience. But I love Carcassonne, and what that means is I'm very curious to try this out. It seems like it's going to feel very familiar while also feeling quite different. Uh, in this one, you're juggling putting meeples out and pulling them back again, and you have the ability to pull meeples back from areas that are just not working out very well for you, which seems like an interesting uh, tension, and also it seems kind of nice, which is interesting because I normally don't think of Colavini designs as being particularly nice, and Carcassonne can be a very mean game overall. Um, either way, I'm not going to like rush out and try to get a copy of this one, but if I ever have a chance to play it, I will certainly do so because I'm just really curious to see how it feels um, different from the original Carcassonne, which is, again, a game I absolutely love. Next up, we have Card Runners. This says, access buildings and take down the man. Uh, this is designed by a friend of mine, Travis Hill, so take this with a grain of salt, uh, but this is a two-player game uh, that takes 30 to 45 minutes, uh, and it's going to be published by Travis's uh, publishing company, Presspot Games. Uh, now, down here, it says this is a two-player cooperative 55-card game. Players are cyberpunks trying to find the right combination of access codes to break into five buildings before the system crashes or the police arrive. It's a 30-minute game of hand management, recipe fulfillment, and sticking it to the man. Uh, it says players are going to navigate through a 3x3 three three grid of buildings with specific access codes. At the same time, players are playing, tucking, and swapping cards from a central row in the hopes of collecting the needed access codes to break into the buildings. Once a player has the correct combination, they immediately take down the building, and once you've done this for five buildings, you win. Otherwise, the police arrive and you lose. And that's a high-level overview of the game. It seems like it's uh, pretty straightforward. I have not had a chance to play it. And there are some photos of what the game looks like online, although the photos don't appear to show the game being played. It's just the components. It looks like the cards have a bunch of symbols around the outside of them. I imagine there's going to be some adjacency and matching of the symbols as you're doing the, the code cracking. And I'm just really curious about this game. Uh, I'm not generally crazy about um, cooperative games, uh, but it seems kind of interesting. A two-player cooperative game. Uh, and also, again, this is designed by a friend of mine, and I think uh, that they have make some really cool stuff. And so that's Part of the reason why I'm talking about it here. <laughs> uh, definitely a perk, I guess, of being my friend. <laughs> Either way, uh, that is Card Runners. I'm looking forward to learning more about the actual details of how it plays. Next up, we have Cargo Empire. It says, build networks and deliver cargo in a fantasy land. Now, the designers of this game are not familiar to me, but the publisher is. Modius Games are the original publisher of Mini Rails as well as Mini Express and some other games that I can't think of right now. But either way, these are Cube Rails games. Uh, and I love Mini Rails. I think it's an absolutely brilliant design. And so that really caught my attention here. Um, this looks like it might be kind of like a Cube Rails game. Uh, that right now, there's only one image of the uh, for the game, and it's the, the cover. Uh, apparently, it's not the final cover, but we definitely see a big train kind of steaming through the uh, kind of a fantasy landscape. But it says this is a pick up and deliver board game, which is not normally the central mechanic for Cube Rails. So... It looks like this game might be more about, again, point-to-point -point network building as opposed to stocks and everything. In fact, I suspect there is no stocks at all in this game. It seems like it's probably very straightforward from a play perspective, uh, or at least from a rules perspective, but um, hopefully it has some interesting uh, conundrums with the play. There's no images of what the map looks like right now, but it does say that on your turn, there is only one action, and it is transporting cargo. So I don't know if you're, like, laying track to then transport the cargo, if that's the one action that you're doing that must be how it works, but I'm really curious to see specifically how it is going to work. Uh, it's a game that has contracts, hand management, network building, pick up and deliver uh, in, you know, fantasy transportation uh, type categories. And it just seems neat. Uh, I've, again, really enjoyed the games that have come from this publisher, specifically the Cube Rails designs uh, that they have put out. Uh, I, again, I'm not super familiar with these designers. It looks like one of them has a few designs. Uh, I've heard of Sea Dragons as well as Edge of Humanity, but either way, uh, I'm really curious to learn more about this one. It says 60 to 90 minutes for one to five players, which is interesting for a game with only one action. I'm intrigued, and hopefully this is one that I end up liking a lot. After that, we have Katachak. This says, relocate market booths for the best segment areas, but keep them in the same alley. Uh, this was designed by Corn Van Morsel, and it's coming out from Kowali, which is uh, their publishing house. And 
the reason I'm talking about this is because it seems like this is a gamified version of those solo puzzles that you might have seen before, where you have a whole bunch of tokens uh, in a grid, square grid in particular, with a single one missing. Um, the general puzzle for these is where you like slide the whole row over or slide the whole row up, uh, trying to maneuver things around, usually trying to descramble an image or something like that. This game seems to be doing something similar, uh, but instead of sliding the whole row, you're just sliding a single piece over uh, as you're trying to do various things. I'm not exactly exactly sure how the mechanics of it work, but it seems interesting for it to be a gamified version of that sort of solo puzzle that's been around probably for hundreds of years. As you're sliding things or these things around, trying to align them in various ways to score various points. Uh, there is a somewhat sizable description uh, talking about the various things. Uh, it says, you know, grid movement with a square grid. Um, again, I'm not sure exactly how all these things specifically score. It apparently has goals that you're competing for. Uh, but yeah, mostly I'm just talking about it because that's kind of neat, <laughs> seeing a competitive game using that old uh, puzzle element. Next up, we have Depredador Natural. Uh, it says, Predators fiercely compete for praise in different biomes. This is a card game. It's a trick-taking game. The first one I've talked about today. It's kind of amazing I'm this many games in. <laughs> I haven't talked about a trick-taking game, although I've already talked about a bunch of cube rails. Um, this game jumped out to me, first of all, because of the artwork. I think it looks really cool. <laughs> it's got uh, stunning artwork. We've got rabbits, which are the prey on a whole bunch of these cards. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of predators with, like, an alligator slash crocodile, a tiger, a bear, a lion, various things like that. It's just a really stunning, vibrant uh, look to the game. Uh, oh, this got some more prey, it looks like, over here. So it seems like the main hook for this game is that um, you have various biomes, I guess, probably suits, and you're playing this, uh, I believe, must-follow trick-taking game where you're taking prey of different colors into your score pile, but you don't actually know what you're going to score positive points for at the start of a hand. Uh, as the hand goes on, each person is going to claim a biome and you're gonna score positive points for that biome and I think negative points for all the other ones. So I imagine there is a tension there where you want to win some tricks and see how many of different colors you're gonna get. And then once you've got a whole bunch of those colors, then try to get the biome. But what if somebody else has got, grabbed that biome already before you? Uh, there's a little bit of a worry that maybe people will just get in their own lanes and I just take all the green and I score for green and you take all the black and you score for black. There's probably more going on to this game to stop that being uh, something that happens every single time. But I think it's a curious idea um, going after specific scoring conditions that you're not exactly sure where they are. I imagine also if you open things up and you just take the green scoring thing, then everybody might just pile on making sure you don't get any green cards, which could also be a problem. Maybe it's a cool game. Maybe it's not. Either way, I love the art aesthetic of it, and I'm curious to try out that hook and see if it ends up uh, delivering on what it appears to be promising. Next up, we have Diluvium, the second 4X game I'm talking about today. Uh, it says it lasts in less than an hour. It says 15 to 60 minutes for one to four players. There's not a lot of detail about this game, uh, and I'm largely uh, talking about it for the same reason as I talked about that other one earlier. Uh, I'm just curious to see how this uh, publisher slash designer is going after um, a short 4X experience. Uh, it says, as a leader of a powerful civilization, you must explore and settle islands available to you with the goal of gaining the most gold possible. Players choose one of four actions on their turn, explore, settle, produce, or engage, which are essentially those four X's. The game ends as soon as any one resource pool is exhausted, and then the civilization with the most gold will be the winner. Uh, and that's all we have right now on BGG, uh, except for a image of the box cover. I think it's pretty cool. I actually really like the artistic aesthetic of the box cover. That, that looks great to me, but there is no images of what the game actually looks like. Um, this could be something I like. I mean, I'm not against 4X games anymore. Um, I'm, I'm not super into them, but if it lasts in 60 minutes, then I'm, I'm absolutely intrigued to see how they're going after it. Uh, it might seem silly, but specifically it talks about settling islands available to you. That makes me feel like there's going to be a lot of water on this map. And for some reason, that feels more compelling to me than just like a big map um, that has small water areas. I like the idea of a lot of water and small islands that you're working from. Uh, yeah, anyway, this seems like it could be neat. I'm looking forward to learning a lot more about it because currently there is not much to go on on BGG. Next up, we have Dorf Romantic Das Duel. Uh, now, Dorf Romantic just won the uh, Spiel des Jahres? Kennerspiel? One of those two. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the Spiel des Jahres 2023. Uh, so, the original Dorf Romantic was a cardboard version of the video game, which was a solo um, kind of hexagonal Carcassonne experience. And the Dorf Romantic board game that just won uh, the Spiel des Jahres was a fully cooperative game where you're essentially doing 
the same kind of things as the video game. It seems like it's very similar. I have not had a chance to play that one, but I do know that like the number one thing I've seen people ask for about Dorf Romantic was a competitive variant so that it's not just cooperative building up this island. And that's what this is. It says you compete by building romantic landscapes. It's a two-player game. It says 30 to 45 minutes. And specifically, uh, it seems like each person is building out their own area. So um, if you're not familiar with the uh, video game or the uh, board game, uh, in this one, you are drawing these uh, hexagonal tiles and you're putting them down and you're also uh, depending on certain situations grabbing these objective tiles that you're also putting down and these objectives ask you to do certain things like have a village area of size five or more next to that objective and have a you know farm of three or more next to that objective and depending on how well you do that you're going to win or lose the game and the video game as well as the original board game have a campaign element where the better you do, the more new tiles and new mechanics you unlock, and you bring those into the base game so that the next time you play it, there's more variety, there's more stuff going on. So in this game, it's a competitive game. Each person is building their own area. It looks like uh, the person on the left over here has red buildings and the person on the right has blue buildings to try and differentiate things. And uh, going back to the description, it says it's still about uh, friendliness, but it's friendly competition, and the basic principles of the uh, the other game have been uh, retained. Uh, it says that this is a two-player game or two teams, and if you have two copies of the game, then up to four people can play, which sounds pretty neat as well. Um, so I'm very intrigued by this because I love tile-laying games, and I've been wanting to play the Dorf Romantic board game. I, I own the video game. I played it a decent amount. I thought it was lovely. Um, and I've been curious to try the board game version, but I haven't like gone out of my way to get it. I think largely because we just don't play much cooperative games in my various groups. I'm not against cooperative games. They just don't really excite me that much. So having a competitive version of this game, which I really have enjoyed in video game form, uh, is very compelling to me. So I think this one is a game that I'm definitely going to seek out to at least play at some point, if not just grab a copy of it. I like two-player only games as well. So really looking forward to trying this one out. Next up, we have Ethereum. It says, make your way through a 3D game board to collect the precious ether. Uh, there's only one image on BGG, and it's the box cover, and uh, I think it looks lovely. I really like the art style on that image. It's, it's honestly a really good-looking box cover. Uh, and in the description, it's rather large. Uh, most of this uh, is all about the theme of the game, though. This is a planet that has ether, which defies the laws of gravity and space-time. The planet like kind of broke up when it got hit by an asteroid. And so now there's a bunch of floating pieces stuck together by the ether. It sounds like it's just a, a, a thematic explanation for why you have a board with various areas that are connected by, by probably lines. There isn't an image of the board, but that's kind of my suspicion. Um, but one of the main reasons I'm talking about this is this 3D board element, which again, they don't have any images of the game, so I don't know how it works, but I'm curious. It says the 3D board of Ethereum is made up of cardboard boxes that are easy to set up and to store each game, six people can mix and play with their own unique abilities. Uh, each turn, which represents a season, players will program their actions, and there's going to be seven seasons to the game. You're going to be developing, attacking, or defending. Uh, you're going to be doing resource optimization um, uh, and also trying to minimize your luck, and you're also trying to produce things. Kind of sounds 4 I, I didn't expect to talk about so many 4X type games, but here's another one, uh, and it says there's multiple uh, paths to victory uh, with uh, tokens and special abilities, and there's ether that you can gain. It, it does seem honestly quite 4 xy even though it doesn't specifically mention that. But it does mention programming, and under mechanisms it says programmed movement. So that is probably how they're going to make a game where you have two to four players that's going to be done in 45 to 60 minutes, because I imagine a lot of the decisions are simultaneous as you're planning things out, uh, programming things out, that is, and then you uh, evaluate those things somehow. I'm extrapolating a lot because, again, there's a lot of text here, but most of it is theme. Uh, I'm really curious to see specifically what this 3D board element looks like. Uh, they, they talk about it a couple of times. They definitely think it's a selling point. So hopefully at some point soon, we'll see an image. Uh, it is listed as a 2024 game, and it's only July, so it might be a while. But either way, that is Ethereum. Next up, we have France Rails. Build railroads across France. Very straightforward. Uh, so this is a three to five player game, 45 to 75 minutes, designed by John Borer and published by Winsome Games. Um, they are still publishing games uh, very rarely these days. Uh, it's my understanding that Winsome is largely retired, but still occasionally putting out games. Specifically, it seems like games like this that use a previous title's 
mechanics with just like a new board and maybe some new uh, flavor and variety. So this one says that France Rails is the next incarnation that uses the same turn order mechanism found in the previous games in the series, namely Preussebahn, Ostbahn, then German Railways, and now Prussian Rails by Rio Grande, which is coming out this year. Uh, so this turn order mechanism is one that I've, I've heard a lot about, but I haven't actually had a chance to try. I really do want to try German Railways. But the idea is that you put these action cubes into a bag and then you pull them out and that's going to be the actions that players can do. And I think even in the order in which those uh, cubes come out. And I think it's kind of a balancing thing where the player with the most money or the player who's doing the best puts the least cubes into the bag. So it's probable that they won't get as many actions as other people or they might not take any actions at all. Um, this is a very... Uh, polarizing mechanic, as far as I can tell. Some people really like it, and some people say it's terrible, it's way too random. Uh, but I've heard that if you just lean into the randomness and the fun and don't worry about it too much and don't try to, like, min-max the game, you can enjoy it. And here is a new game um, set on a different map. It's in uh, France instead of Germany, and it says that there's eight railroads that have special abilities or limitations, and I believe those original games also had, like, asymmetries for each of the different companies. So this is essentially an expansion map with new stuff, a new map, uh, but the same uh, rule set, and I'm curious about it. I mean, I want to try German rails, uh, railways, that is, um, just to see what this mechanism looks like. Maybe I'll end up playing uh, France rails before I actually get there. But either way, I'd still be trying out this weird turn order uh, mechanic, and I could see if I'm on the, yeah, it's fun side, or the, no, this is way too random side of things. Next up, we have Galileo Galilei. Uh, this is a 2024 release. It says, discover what Galileo itself didn't, find new planets and star systems. So uh, the designer is Tomas Holick, and this is their only design on BGG. Uh, there's no images of what this game looks like, but the description caught my attention. It says that Galileo Galilei is a Euro-style game in which you will take on the role of an astronomer trying to discover unknown star systems or planets, develop their telescope, or make scientific breakthroughs, all in a difficult age of obscurity. Obscurantism. I have never seen that word before. <laughs> it says, in the game, you will use your telescope to choose the, uh, the right action from five available. Each action can be developed to better versions. The main goal is to collect colored lenses of three main colors, which will help you make your discoveries. You will collect cards of different planets or star systems. But beware of the Inquisitor. They will come unwelcomed, and your fame can be ruined very quickly. But you can also find a way and how to profit from their visit. So it seems like it's a Euro game where you're set in the... Galileo time frame doing uh, astronomer type stuff. It has action drafting, area majority, deck building set in the uh, the category for uh, Renaissance. And that's it. That, that's really all it says. I'm largely just curious to learn more about it, see what it looks like. It seems like a game that could look really interesting. I like the idea of this uh, telescope action selection system with five different options. Maybe there's like a gimmick there, or maybe it's just a thematic way of saying, choose one of these five things on every single one of your turns. Uh, I'm curious to see how this uh, this uh, this pans out. Uh, I think the theme of it is quite interesting overall. It definitely seems like a good spot for a Euro game to work off from. And I'm curious to see what this deck bag pool building means overall for this game and the action drafting. That might have something to do with how this telescope works. Next up, we have Havalandi. Uh, now, this is... <laughs> the game from Reiner Kinesia that I'm talking about. It seems like pretty much every Games Radar vlog I talk about at least one Reiner Kinesia design. Uh, this game says you're forming valuable groups and you're finding the best moment to launch your balloons. So this is a game about hot air balloon management, it seems like. In here, it says you are trying to score points by clever placement of balloons. Um, you are managing hot air balloons that are going to be dappling the sky and somehow you're scoring points for them. Uh, it says there's launch sites um, for these uh, of these pavilions that are highly coveted and they're offering you various opportunities to earn points. You have to choose the right launch site at the right time to score lots of points for your fleet. It says it's a 45 to 60 minute game for two to four players, which means it's, you know, encroaching on the medium side of things. Uh, just looking at the description, it wouldn't have surprised me to see like a 20 minute time frame for this game. So it seems like maybe there's a little bit more going on here than just a really, really light experience. Uh, it's really light on specifics on how the mechanics work, although under mechanisms it says there's connections, dice rolling, end game bonuses, a hexagonal grid, once per game abilities, and tile placement. So I have no idea how any of that stuff is going to work in with the overall theme here, uh, but I can just imagine 
what a hexagonal grid looks like with a whole bunch of hot air balloons on it scattered around in maybe different patterns. Maybe you're trying to make linkages of patterns of, of, your, of your specific balloons, or maybe the balloons are neutral and you're trying to mix them around to match up with your own goals. There's a lot of different ways this could go. And in general, I enjoy Reiner Kinesia's designs, especially the ones that are more in the 60 minute time frame versus like 20 minutes. A lot of his games are very light. Uh, so yeah, I'm intrigued to learn more about this one. I also feel like it could look really beautiful, like a game all about hot air balloons floating through the sky. I'm curious to see what that looks like on the table. Next up, we have Hextraction, which is a game I am 100% talking about because it looks so cool on the table. It says players compete to lay tiles and race a ball to the end of the board. It says it plays a one to a 99 players in 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, the designer is Zach Friedman, who... I believe has a really popular YouTube channel. Uh, there's one video for this game that I watched a decent amount for, and it has like an astonishing amount of subscribers. So I think a big part of it is the 3D printing element because this is a game that's open source. Uh, apparently it's free um, to get the files. <laughs> so if you have the ability to 3D print things, then you can. And specifically, this is a game where you're competing to get your ball from the top of the board uh, down to the bottom. And on your turn, you are going to be placing a tile or rolling a ball. And the first player to roll their ball into one of the bottom spaces wins. Uh, there's a few images of what the game looks like. And yeah, it's a slanted board that's 3D printed. It's got spots to put various hexagonal um, tiles in. And then you're slotting these tiles and then trying to roll the ball to make it all the way to the end. And the images that they have on BGG are very straightforward and simple. But I will say that the, uh, <laughs> the, the options they showed in that video, the video is quite long. It's 31 minutes, are, are nuts. And it seems like the idea is that this is almost like a collectible tile game, uh, not from a like, oh, this is a, a rare tile or anything like that. Because again, apparently all these files are going to be um, uh, free to get access to, but you can print the tiles that you think are specifically cool, like tiles with floppy things on them or various, uh, you know, locking logic gates and various things that you can do. And you can print out the ones that you like and you can meet up with other people who've printed out their own and you can mix and match and then play these games with just tons of variety. Um, this is not a game I'm particularly interested in actually playing. I mostly just wanted to talk about it because it looks so dang cool. <laughs> I mean, again, this image is not doing it justice. It looks like a very simple setup. There is some really wacky stuff that I saw in that video. It just seems like an exciting thing if I was really into 3D printing. I don't have a 3D printer. It's not something that I've been particularly gravitating towards at any point, but I know a lot of people do own printers or have access to them. And maybe those people would be interested in giving this game a shot because it seems like in theory, it's probably a very cool experience, especially to like mix and match and bring various tiles and see what other tiles people have come up with. You know, you could design your own tiles and then play with those. It just seems like a really cool ecosystem for a game. Next up, we have Highland Whist. Uh, this is a trick-taking game. Uh, it's designed by a friend of mine, Sean Ross. Uh, he also designed Haggis, and we've co-designed a couple of games together as well. Uh, in this game, it says, clamber to the highest peaks and nudge your opponent over the edge. Uh, so this is a game that I've actually play-tested uh, a couple of times, and then I played a final version of the game. The rules are essentially final uh, once, and I like it a lot. I, I think it's a, a cool game. Uh, it says this is a casual trick taker for four players with fixed partnerships, so two versus two, and the teams are going to score based off of the number of tricks they capture. But the scoring is all about peaks, and uh, specifically, uh, there's an image of what, ah, here we go, there's an image of what the scoring looks like, um, and this is why it's called Highland. Uh, we got the Highlands and then Lowlands with all these different peaks, and and you're going to deal out a standard deck of cards. Um, that means each person's going to have 13 cards in their hand. Um, there is one extra card to set Trump, but I'm trying not to go into the details. But essentially, you just deal out the cards and then you start playing. It feels like a classic trick taker. I mean, that's why it's called Highland Whist. That's the classic nature. But there's no bidding. And I like bidding in trick-taking games. I actually really like it these days, but I remember being very intimidated and put off by bidding in these trick-takers when I first started playing them. It's like, how many tricks am I gonna win? I have no idea. I don't know how to play this game. And Highland Whist gets away from that and it really gets you into the play because there is no bidding. Instead, what you're trying to do is land on a specific high spot. So in order to get four points for your team, you would win five or six of the 13 tricks. If you win that seventh uh, trick, then suddenly you're getting zero points and your opposing team gets four points. So the closer to the middle you are, the more precarious it is, but also the more points you can get. If you have just amazing hands of cards and you blow through uh, and win 11 out of the 13 tricks, you actually score zero points 
points and the opposing team scores one. So you're trying to angle for these spots, but you're not allowed to talk with your partner. So you're feeling things out, playing cards and watching the cards that they play, and you're trying to make decisions. Like, does it seem like they're intentionally losing tricks? Well, maybe that's because they feel like their hand is strong, and that means they can uh, come back in and win more tricks uh, later on so we get to that specific spot. Or maybe their hand is just really weak and they're not trying to lose tricks, they're just losing tricks. Um, so you play the game until you hit, I believe it is 10 victory points. There's a bags variant um, that might become the standard rules, I'm not really sure, but um, I really like this game, honestly. Uh, some people have said that they think it's, it's quite casual and quite light, and it is, but I will say that I've really enjoyed the play of it. And this isn't supposed to be an impressions vlog, but I've really enjoyed playing this one. I think it's a, it's just a really fun way to get into a two versus two game and you just start playing, deal out the cards and go and feel it out. And it has a lot of tension as you're trying to angle for these specific Highland spots. I think it's a super smart design and I'm looking forward to playing it more. Uh, <laughs> next up we have Hund. I just realized I, I accidentally gave like an impressions segment for that game, but either way, here is the new game. This is Hund. Uh, now specifically, this is a re-implementation of a game called Ebbs or Ebs or something like that. Uh, this is a game I've not played, uh, Ebs in particular, but it's one I've heard lots of really good things about. And uh, a friend of mine, uh, Taylor, who has Taylor's trick-taking table, uh, he made a video about Ebs. I just watched it to learn how this game plays. So this is essentially a dog retheme for the original game. And the game seems very interesting to me. Uh, I can see why my friends have talked so highly about it. Uh, it's a trick-taking game where at the start of each round, you're not sure what is good. Kind of reminds me of Highland Whist to a certain extent, where at the beginning you're like, I'm not sure what we're going to try to do here. But in this game, uh, which I believe is fully competitive, you're not sure what suit is Trump, you're not sure what suit will be positive points, what suit will be negative points, and as you play through the hand, that is dictated. So um, essentially the first time a card is played that matches a specific condition, it's like, boom, okay, Trump is this color. And then the next time, the next card to match that condition is going to be like, okay, those are the cards that are worth positive points. And you, as you go, you're going to be slotting these little tokens these little dog tokens uh, into various spots on the board. And this will show people specifically, you know, what is Trump, what's positive, what's negative, um, what's going to have bonus points for being in the middle. And it looks like it's like crowns and hearts and bones and skulls and that kind of stuff. It, I really like the look of this rethemed game. Uh, honestly, it just looks like a lot of fun. I can see why a lot of my trick-taking friends speak so highly about Ebes and I love the theming of this one. Dogs are great. Uh, I think um, the aesthetic of it, the artistic aesthetic of it is wonderful as well. So I think it's likely this is a game we're going to end up acquiring. It's certainly a game that I very much want to play. Next up, we have Match of the Century. Two grandmasters of chess face in a thrilling competition. So this is a two-player game coming out from uh, Deep Print and Capstone. Uh, and they've done a lot of two-player games recently with like Watergate, Rift Force, and others. And this seems like another one coming out from that kind of line. And specifically, the designer is Paolo Mori, who's designed so many big games. Uh, we've got uh, Libertalia, we've got Ethnos, Blitzkrieg, uh, Dogs of War, 47 credits on BGG, just uh, a ton of games. This is a, a very well-known board game designer, and I've quite enjoyed a lot of their games. Uh, so coming back to the match of the century, um, this game is all about a chess game. So it's a game about a chess match. Uh, specifically, it says it's the summer of 1972 and the final match of the World Chess Championship in Reykjavik saw the ultimate showdown. American Bobby Fischer challenged the reigning world champion Boris Spassky from the Soviet Union. Um, so this game is about that game. Uh, it says you play as one another over a series of games, just as in the real championship match. However, here each game lasts only a few uh, short and intense turns, so every decision counts in pulling off the win. As you play cards with unique effects from your asymmetric decks, each of you will manipulate the mental endurance of the other and the outcome of each quick game, uh, but you're going to weigh your options carefully because only by giving up the advantage can you use your card's effects. Uh, there's one image of what the game looks like, so you're not playing chess. Uh, it is a card game, I'm assuming, with a bunch of hand management of the cards that you have. Um, it looks like there's lane combat, kind of, maybe sort of like battle line or or something like that. Uh, I'm quite curious to see how chessy it actually feels in the mechanics. It wouldn't surprise me if it's not chessy at all. It seems like it's very much leaning into that idea of the asymmetric decks and trying to win with the, like, chess playing personality of these different players as opposed to actually playing chess. It is interesting seeing another, like, meta game, though. <laughs> playing a game about a chess tournament is certainly an interesting theme. 
Next up, we have Ovu, which is a game I'm going to talk about very quickly. Uh, it just looks neat. Uh, it says, you are in the Gobi Desert in Mongolia. You take stones from the Ovu, these stone embankments erected in the Mongolian shamanic culture in order to communicate with deities of the mountains, use strategy to place them wisely, and build the tallest Karn to claim victory. Uh, it's a two to four player game in 15 minutes and... I'm, again, mostly talking about this because how it looks. Uh, it's a stacking game with these various colored tiles. It looks like you're building up a wall. And the tiles all have this not not quite rectangular shape. There's kind of a piece cut out. And I'm not sure how these all tile together. I have no idea how the rules work. Usually in these games, Radar Vlogs, I talk about at least one game specifically because how it looks uh, makes it seems compelling. And that's this game. Uh, it seems like it's matching the theme uh, of the specific uh, Karn that, that have, were built out in Mongolia. Obviously, it doesn't look that similar, but it's going after that uh, that theme. And yeah, it just seems like a neat game. Not one I'm going to be hunting down by any means, but I always like highlighting games that just have a cool aesthetic on the table. And for some reason, this one jumped out to me. Next up, we have Portals. Uh, I'm talking about this game because the designer is Uwe Rosenberg. It says, you're finding portals to magical fairy realms, and you are becoming a path master of the Portal Guild. It's a one to two player game, 15 to 30 minutes, and uh, it seems like it might be you know, kind of in that patchwork vein, uh, definitely with the time frame and the player count. It says, again, it's a two-player tile-playing game set in this fantasy world, and uh, in this game, you're going to collect magical energies of fairy realms by drafting tiles and placing them in your area. Whenever you collect enough magical energy from one type, you open a portal to the corresponding realm, which means you are allowed to place a portal stone on one of your tiles. The first one who can place all of their portal stones will win the game. So that sounds kind of like Nova Luna to a certain extent. I mean, that game was all about uh, pattern matching to put tokens onto your tiles, and the first person to place all of their tokens is going to win the game. So it seems like maybe it's more in that kind of vein, although Nova Luna played more than two players. It does say that there's a hexagonal grid, so um, it's probably hexagons that you're putting down, not polyominoes like in Patchwork. Uh, it has tile placement and obviously a solo mode as well. Um, it's a pretty quick game. Uh, I don't think this is one I'm going to rush out to try and play, but I'm definitely curious to see how it's going to work. I do like tiling games. I think two-player tiling games that play in 30 minutes can be quite fascinating. Um, uh, Patchwork was a great game, and, you know, that was uh, Polyominoes, whereas this one doesn't appear to be. But I'm quite curious to see what Uwe Rosenberg has come up uh, with this time. Uh, he's definitely done a lot of tiling games in this same kind of vein. Next up, we have Road Behind. Uh, this is a solo game, and I usually don't talk about solo games in this Radar Vlog because I personally don't find solo games to be that interesting. I just don't enjoy playing them. But... I don't know, something about this one seemed compelling. I wanted to highlight it. It says, you are managing the risk and you're surviving in this game uh, that is inspired by Cormac McCarthy's book, The Road. Uh, it's a one-player game, 45 to 60 minutes. And it says, as nuclear winter spreads throughout all the continents, obliterating the planet's ecology, you realize that it's not safe to be by yourself raising a toddler. You pack what little food you have left, a few clothes, and open the hidden entrance of the complex for the first time in about five years since this uh, nuclear apocalypse. It says this is a survival risk management solitaire game in which you and your child travel south along a winding road, avoiding dangerous people and inhospitable places, rummaging for food and shelter among disasters, and looking for a latitude where the disaster hasn't reached, on which you and especially the kid can start a new life. Um, so in this game, uh, on your turns, you're going to be doing things like performing actions, drawing action cards, consuming food, updating weather, doing all those kind of things, and you are going to be laying out this path of cards, which just looks really neat. I mean, again, this is the main reason I'm talking about it, because I think from a table presence perspective, it just looks super cool. <laughs> uh, you have all of these cards. And this is obviously a prototype or a print and play, but you have these cards that are being played on top of each other, making a winding road, having forks in the road that you decide not to go down. You're going over here, you're going over there, you have triple forks. It just seems like you are going on a journey and you could see where the journey started and where it's ending. There's a bunch of tracks that you're going to be charting things with, uh, cubes. It looks like there's uh, injuries, there's crazy people, there's good people, there's uh, darkness, there's various encounters, there's food and morale and all these different things that you are juggling. I have no idea if this is actually going to be a fun game. I, I 
will never play this game because I'm just not interested in solo games, but a lot of people are. And I just thought this one looked compelling and I wanted to give it a little bit of attention. It just seems like a really neat uh, mechanical idea and uh, a thematic space to explore as you're, you know, going down this road as you're uh, plotting it out on the, the table. Very much feels like an exploration game that that feels like you're exploring as you're just plotting out to see where the road actually ends up taking you, hopefully towards victory. Next up, we have Road to Lord. <laughs> We're talking about roads. Uh, this is a trick-taking game. It says, uh, it's easy to win by using multiple cards to create a big number, but... <laughs> But period. I think that's funny. Uh, so this is a two to four player trick taking game. It says it takes 10 to 15 minutes. It has a decent size description and it has a video that um, essentially explains how the game works. Um, it says English, but the all the language is in Japanese. But the reason I'm talking about this game is because it has a really interesting idea where you have a hand of cards and it's trick taking. So you're trying to play the highest value card into the trick, but you can combine multiple cards. So if you have like a three, uh, seven and a one, you could add those together to have it be a 371 or a 173. There's also single and double zero cards. So you could put like four, five, seven, zero, zero, and you just put down a 45,700 <laughs> in this trick-taking game. And then, you know, you're trying to check to see who has played the highest number. So I think that's why it says it's easy to win because you just put this massive number out. But the catch, specifically the but here, is if you play all of your cards uh, before the end of the round or by the end of the round, you get penalized or you get bad things happen. I'm not sure if it's a small penalty or if you just like don't score any points at all. So you're trying to not play all of your cards before the actual game ends. But of course, you're trying to win tricks with the cards that you have. So you're pushing your luck, essentially. It's not really a push your luck game, but you're, you're trying to see how far you can go and just how many cards you can throw down while try not to run out of gas by the very end. I imagine you're forced to play at least one card, which would drag you towards potentially running out of cards if you go too hard with some of the big numbers early. It just seems like a really interesting conceit for a game. I have no idea if it's actually fun to play, but I like talking about games with fascinating mechanics, and this one definitely fits the bill. Uh, thematically, it seems super plain, super, you know, straightforward. Ah, oh, the local lords are competing and there's a king and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I'm not talking about the game because of that. I'm talking about it because it almost seems like an anti-shedding trick-taking game because you don't want to play all of your cards, but by playing cards, you're winning tricks. So it just seems fascinating. Hopefully I have a chance to try this one at some point. After that, we have Robo Trick, which is... Spoiler alert, the best game I've played in a while. I've loved this game. I played it uh, four times now. Uh, I played it at the Portland Games Convention. I've played it subsequently. This is not an impressions section, but uh, it's a radar section, and I just learned about this game. I played it four times, and I'm absolutely in love with it. Uh, if you want to lear learn a whole bunch about it, then uh, please back the Patreon campaign. I talk about it at great length uh, in one of those opinions episodes, and I'm probably going to talk about it more in the future because I keep playing this game. Uh, but anyway, this is a three-player only trick taking game with a programmable robot player. Uh, so essentially, it's a fully competitive game. You have to have three people, doesn't play with two or four, and you're competing with each, each other and this robot. One of these robot cards is going to be placed out in each of the game's rounds, and the robot's hand is also going to be face up. So you deal out all the cards, well, most of the cards, and then that card, that robot card, dictates how the robot will lead cards into a trick, how they will follow cards into a trick if they match, how they will not follow into a trick if they don't have any cards of that color. And it is this fascinating game of trying to plot what is going to happen. You know exactly what the robot's going to do based off of the programming card they have in front of them. There's a whole bunch of different cards. And each round feels like a different puzzle trying to work things to your advantage because you're generally scoring cards from the robot, but you don't want to score too many cards. It's just an incredibly tight beautiful looking game um, that I, again, I try not to shift into the impressions uh, piece for this one, but I can say that uh, I'm very glad I learned about this one because it's uh, it's excellent. <laughs> and uh, hopefully I can get a copy of it. I'm worried to be talking about it right now because it's already difficult to come up with a copy. It's not an easy game to get, but um, uh, everyone I've talked to about this game so far has enjoyed it a lot. Uh, all right, next up we have Shakespeare's First Folio. Suddenly we're talking about a bunch of trick-taking games with the alphabetical order here. It says, you compete to assemble and print Shakespeare's First Folio. So thematically and mechanically, this game seems quite fascinating. The designer is Kevin Bertram, and they... Oh, okay. Uh, they designed Shores of Tripoli and... Uh, 
several other games. Uh, specifically, this game is being published by Fort Circle Games, who it, I think is you know associated with the uh, the designer here. Uh, now, in this game, it says players are taking on the role of printers in the early 17th century, competing to print the first folio of Shakespeare's plays. Uh, but it's a a trick taking game. It says uh, in this game, uh, you have a deck of plays that's dealt out to the players, and you are going to be doing trick taking. And the cards that you're playing in are going to be cards that you also I think can print somehow, and then it says after you do the trick taking, the game transitions into a worker placement game with options like gathering resources, uh, with that are dice from a marketplace. You're purchasing plays, you're hiring people, and you're spinning the wheel of fortune. Uh, it says the last player to spin uh, this one will be the first player in the next turn. So it seems like there's a lot going on here: uh, randomness with dice and a wheel, uh, and uh, trick plays to try and get the plays of Shakespeare. I'm fascinated by this game. I have no idea if it's actually going to be a game that's fun, but Fort Circle Games um, did put out some really good-looking games like Votes for Women, so I trust that this game will probably look amazing, uh, and I'm just super intrigued to see how trick-taking and worker placement and die-rolling and all this stuff is going to come together in a wonderful player game that only lasts 45 to 60 minutes. Uh, yeah, super intrigued by this one. Next up, we have Spellbloom. Uh, it says, roll your dice, learn new spells, and become the wisest wizard of them all. So down below, it says uh, that uh, every 100 years, the solar system's planets align and magic happens on this one particular island, and you're all uh, mages or wizards, and you're trying to make use of that, uh, trying to get points. It says, this is a tableau-building open drafting game in which players are learning new spells to score the most knowledge points. It says, during the game, players roll dice that are used as both the price and resources. So I wonder if it's like you roll dice and then decide, like, this is the price and that's the resource, or this is the resource and that's the price, or whatever. I I'm not really sure. There's not a lot of details, but that seems like an interesting idea at a high level. And it says, you are using these dice to learn new spells and collect them into spell books. And each spell has its own unique ability that can help the player learn new spells and then uh, or score additional points. Um, but you can run out of energy, which is bad, and you have to rest, and there's you're re rerolling energy dice. It seems like dice are very central to this game. Uh, there's a couple images of the components of the game, uh, but no image of what the game looks like being played. Uh, but it appears, I assume this is a player board? Yeah, yeah, this is a player board uh, where you're going to be probably putting maybe cards down on specific spots. There's um, lots of different uh, euro -y type iconography and lots of dice around. It just seems like it could be a lovely game. I think the artistic aesthetic is nice. Uh, I like die games in general, especially dice games that do interesting things with the dice after you've rolled them, and it feels like this is going to be one of those games. Uh, this is not a game I'm going to rush out to try and play, but uh, I found it somewhat compelling. Again, I like the way it looks. I like the, the box cover and everything, so I wanted to talk about it here. Next up, we have Stupor Mundi. Uh, this is a 2024 release. It says, expand your kingdom in the thriving empire of Frederick II. So a very dry theme, but... This game looks quite cool. Uh, the designer is Nestor Mangone, who has uh, been the uh, at least one of the designers of a ton of very popular Euro games. Darwin's Journey, a game that I know very well, and Newton and Expo 1906 and 31 uh, different things in BGG. Uh, now, the publisher is Quinted Games, and uh, down here it says that well, it's it's very thematic and very kind of dusty Euro type stuff, like Frederick II, the Holy Roman Emperor, and the King of Germany and Italy is doing king type stuff in a in, in that kind of time like the description doesn't say a lot and online there is just an image of what the box cover looks like however uh in the uh forums uh, it's apparently on in, in alpha on board game arena and in one of these threads i found a link to uh the rule book and i got to look through the rule book and it, it looks like this game is a euro game uh, 90 to 150 minutes one to four players that has a variety of stuff going on. It's got a lot of icons. It's got a lot of things out on the player board and the main board, but it looks like it has a rondelle mechanism. And it's interesting because it doesn't say rondelle over here in the mechanism, but glancing through the rule book, it seemed like there is a circular track that you can move uh, this ship around on a central board, and that will dictate the various things that you can do. Um, also, on your turn, you're playing cards into your own personal tableau. Then if you play the card face up, you do what the card says. But if you put the card face down, then there's like arrows on the card that point to various actions on your player board, and you can choose one of those actions. It seems like it's got a bunch of stuff going on, and the more I I looked at in the rulebook, the more interested I got. It definitely seems like it has quite a bit going on. It does say 90 to 150 minutes, so not a 
medium game, like definitely verging on the more heavy side of things. But I'm super intrigued by this. Apparently, it's in uh, uh, alpha on Board Game Arena, so there's going to be a way to play it there, which is also pretty exciting overall. Uh, yeah, it's hard to exactly put my my finger on why this one really caught me. I, I will say, you know, full disclosure, Quinta Games is a client of mine. I've made, done a lot of sponsored content for them. So keep that in mind. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to do sponsored content for this game in particular, but um, I'm really intrigued to uh, to get into it more. I mean, again, there is a rule book out there. It's uh, not the final rule book, but it is out there. And I just haven't spent the time to read through the whole thing. But what I've read so far has definitely piqued my interest. Next up, we have The Academy. It says, look toward the viewer as you figure out how to play. That doesn't make much sense to me, but the reason I'm talking about this is because it is a trick-taking game. <laughs> yes, there's a lot of these, uh, but it has variable roles, which seems kind of interesting. Specifically, it says in each round, players are taking on a different role. Uh, there's a captain who is uh, setting the tone and hopes for active support from other people. There's a mastermind who makes up their own rules. There's a rebel that does other things, uh, pursues their own goals. Uh, it seems like every time you play or every hand of the game, you have different like incentives based off of the roles that you have in this trick-taking game. It says it's three to four players in 30 minutes, so not a terribly long game overall, but somewhat standard, I guess, for trick-taking. And I'm just curious. Uh, it says it's a varied and unusual trick-taking game that requires flexible action. And uh, that sounds like something that I would enjoy playing. I don't have anything really else to say about it. There's an image of the box cover, but no uh, real focus on what the game looks like to be played. Uh, it seems intriguing. Maybe it's not actually that interesting in reality, but so far my interest is definitely there and I want to learn more about these different roles that you have as you are playing through the game. After that, we have The Barracks Emperors. It's another trick-taking game, but it's 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 a lot more than that. It's essentially a trick-taking war game. And in, in particular, it does say that. Strategy, war games, card game, political, a whole bunch of stuff. So there's a decent sized description and I'm pretty sure the rulebook is online. Um, this is a trick-taking game where you're doing, I think it said 13 simultaneous tricks. So you have these square cards with different icons on each of the sides, and you're playing cards down into this grid in the middle of the table. Um, and the cards that you play are essentially vying for multiple tricks. And I think you play all the cards and then you evaluate the tricks that are out there based off of I, you know, if there's a Trump suit, I'm not sure if there is, but based off of the value of the cards and how they're pointing at various things. Um, I, I've talked to some people who played this one and enjoyed it, but also who said that it didn't feel terribly trick-taking. So it seems a lot more like kind of area management and kind of control as you're putting these cards down and influencing various tricks uh, that are going to be resolved later on. Um, it seems like it is based off of another game. It says down here, for fans of Time of Crisis and the Age of Iron and Rust, you will find some of the concepts and flavor from that deck-building war game adapted into this all-new standalone game. I know nothing about any of these games. I don't really float in wargaming type circles. Apparently, there's a, a deck building war game that, that uh, this is sort of based off of. And I've definitely seen some hype for this game. People are uh, quite interested in it. Um, it's a game that I would try if I had the opportunity to. Uh, I almost played it at the Portland Game Convention, but it didn't quite line up. I wouldn't mind giving it a try, but I, I wouldn't say I'm like particularly crazy excited to get it played or anything like that. It seems interesting, but it also seems like maybe very uh, area control-y and that kind of thing, which is not necessarily what I'm looking for in trick-taking games that I'm playing. Next up, we have The Six of Eight. Um, it's a card game, it's a trick-taking game, and it's designed by a friend of mine, Carol Legro. Uh, it says it's a trick-taking game along a timeline. Each queen's suit is Trump during her reign. So this is about the six wives of Henry VIII. Uh, and specifically, um, this game has a, a very thematic tie-in, lots of thematic tie-ins. It's a game all about trying to capture points with the trick-taking. It's a two versus two game. And um, as you play through the game, you're going through the reigns of these queens and the length of time a queen was alive and reigning as the queen dictates how long that queen's color in the deck uh, is Trump. And this is an asymmetric deck based off of the length of the reigns. So the, the queens that reigned the longest have the most cards in the deck and the queen who reigned the very shortest amount of time uh, is only Trump for a single round and has the least cards in the deck. And there's points on the cards that depend on various thematic elements to the number of kids, the kind of kids that the various queens had. It's, it's not a complex game by any means. It's a very elegant game. I've really enjoyed my one play of it uh, as it's completed. I play tested it a few times because again, this is designed by a friend of mine, uh, but I really like 
all the subtle thematic touches. It's essentially a a very subtle thematic game, if that makes sense. Uh, the more you dig into it, the more you learn about how all these things have affected the game. There's a Church of England that you can use to annul a trick and that kind of thing. Um, interestingly enough, uh, <laughs> Carol came up with the core idea of this game after playtesting one of my designs. And she was like, hey, have you thought about maybe making the Trump be specific things at specific times along a timeline. And I was like, ah, that doesn't really work for my design. And then like the next day, she's like, I came up with a game based off of that idea I had. And and that's this game. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I really enjoy this game. The game that she was playtesting, I've long since left off to the side. So I'm really glad something positive came from it. Um, this game has been getting quite a lot of buzz from my friend circles. I mean, again, uh, I'm very biased because I, I, I know and really like the designer of this game. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it's neat. I, I highly recommend it. It's not a game you can easily proxy at this point. I mean, you can put Sharpie on cards and whatnot, and I'm not sure. Yeah, it doesn't look like the rules for this one have been published yet, but I'm sure at some point they will. And if you have a chance to try this, I, I definitely recommend it. Next up, we have Turbo Kids, which <laughs> just seems hilarious. It says, teams race head-to-head -head on crazy courses blindfolded. Uh, now, when I first saw this, I, I was instantly not interested in it. A game called Turbo Kids with a Z. I don't know. It doesn't seem like something that's that compelling. And then I saw this image. <laughs> this is a game where you are partnered up and one person is blindfolded and they have a pen or probably a, a dry erase. And the and their partner is grabbing the, the first person's thumb like a joystick and they're controlling the blindfolded person. So based off of how they move that person's thumb, they're going to be drawing on the map. This seems ridiculous. Uh, definitely not a game I'm going to like rush out to buy, but certainly a game that I would totally try if I had an opportunity to. I think from a gimmick perspective, this is amazing. <laughs> I imagine it could be a lot of fun. It says it's two to six players. So I imagine, you know, pairs of people competing against each other. Uh, I don't know if it's timed or any of that kind of stuff. I'm sure it might be the kind of thing where you just go until one person completes the lap without going over any of the lines. I could see this being very silly. I mean, it essentially looks like sort of a party game uh, and you have to be okay, you know, touching one of your friend's thumbs to actually be a joystick. But, oh, it says real time here. This just seems so silly. Uh, the kind of game that I'm really glad exists, even though I'm not sure if I'll ever actually have a chance to play it. After that, we have Waterfall Park. Uh, this game re-implements Chinatown. Uh, same designer. Uh, Chinatown came out in 1999. So uh, here's a new version. And specifically, it says it's a revamped edition of Chinatown, which is a well-known negotiation game. I've never actually played Chinatown or other implementations of it, but I've heard a lot of good things. Uh, it's a game where you're negotiating, putting things down onto a board. Uh, and in this game, it says the goal of the game is to trade and exchange attractions to build the biggest amusement park in the world. The particularity of this park is is that it's built vertically on huge towers in the middle of the ocean. It says this is a shorter and more family-friendly version of Chinatown. Uh, let's see, uh, Waterfall Park is 45 minutes, and Chinatown is listed as 60 minutes. So shorter, but not terribly shorter. And it says the exchanges and interactions have been significantly increased to make the game even better. And that's... Uh, that's all we have. Um, again, I don't know how Chinatown specifically works, but I know a lot of people like Chinatown, so I did want to talk about it here for that reason alone. Uh, I've been curious to try Chinatown for a long time, just never really had an opportunity. So maybe Waterfall Park will end up being my opportunity to give this uh, this a try. I've definitely enjoyed some negotiation games and not others. Uh, who knows? Maybe this is going to be a negotiation game for me. After that, we have Win, which is a re-implementation of Long Shot the Dice Game. And that's the main reason I'm talking about this. Uh, I actually made a sponsored tutorial video for Long Shot the Dice Game. So uh, take what I'm saying here with, with a grain of salt. Uh, that was a horse racing game where you are essentially betting on these horses. There's a, a kind of a, a dry race element to the game. If you're curious about it, then watch my video. But uh, I just want to talk about this because it's a re-implementation of that game uh, in a tiny form. Uh, it has all these really small cards as you're putting these horses out, like they're like long, skinny cards. Uh, the designer of this is Chris Handy, and I think they have a whole bunch of games that are, that use these really skinny cards. So it's like an incredibly tiny little box um, that looks like this. Uh, so it's just curious to see a re-implementation of a game that was already not very big that's now a lot smaller using these different uh, cards. Honestly, I was just kind of compelled by the overall look of this. Uh, but again, you know, keep in mind that I've this is a client of mine <laughs> that I've done work for in the past. 
Uh, next up, we have Yet, which is also from Chris Handy and Perplex. It's funny that these ended up being alphabetically right next to each other. Uh, so again, it's a tiny box, uh, but this game uh, I'm mostly talking about because I love the look of this uh, setup. It looks like there are airships with these long skinny cards, but in particular, there's a clock. Like the board itself is essentially a clock with like an, an hour uh, hand and a minute hand that's going to be kind of rotating around. I think flipping these cards as players are moving around with their airships. Uh, there is a description. It says each round, the clock ticks one hour, flipping over the card in that hour's position. And then players draft action cards and perform precise movements and card or airship rotations in order to position themselves to capture the most time capsules at the end of the round. So this is a quick game, two to three players, 20 to 30 uh, minutes. And I, I don't really have anything else to say about it in particular. Oh, there's an image of the rules <laughs> on BGG right over here. Uh, it just looks neat. Uh, I really like the look of it overall, and sometimes in these radar vlogs, I just like to point out when a game has a compelling table presence, and I think this one does. All right, we've reached the last game I'm talking about today, and it's Zebra, but it's like z 3 ba <laughs> Instead of an E, it's a three. Uh, it says Zebras play with numbers. It's an Amigo game. It says two to five players in 20 minutes, and uh, there's almost nothing about this online. There's a single sentence, and it's enough for me to talk about it in a Games Radar vlog. It says, Zebra is a card game in which zebras develop a unique style of mathematics, one inaccessible to humans. <laughs> <laughs> which is just such a hilarious tagline, essentially, to the game. That's all it says. Um, it's a card game that has no other categorizations. It has an image of the box cover with some zebras, like, yelling at each other or laughing at each other. I'm not really sure what's going on here. Uh, I'm talking about it now, and I'm subscribed to it specifically because I want to learn about zebra mathematics and why humans can't do it. It just seems like a very uh, intriguing and compelling tagline. It's possible this game will end up being bland and uninteresting overall, but they've definitely uh, did a good job of of grabbing my attention. Uh, <laughs> zebra math seems like a ridiculous theme for a game, and who knows, maybe there's going to be a cool 20-minute card game in here. Uh, so yeah, that is the last game I'm talking about today. Uh, 37 games is quite a few. I I originally had like 70 or something like that after my first pass uh, through BGG. Uh, a lot of new games are coming out. Uh, a lot of new games uh, I'm first learning about. And it makes sense. Gen Con is just around the corner. We're very much in convention season at this point. It wouldn't surprise me if I have way too many games to talk about in the next month as well. Uh, but overall, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you found some games that you find interesting. And I do want to ask that if you think I missed a game uh, that I haven't maybe talked about in the past, then please comment about it down below and I'll I'll take a look. Also, if you just have thoughts about any of these games that I've talked about today, then uh, please comment down below. I love getting comments. Yeah, that's going to bring this one to a close. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos just like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, then please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.